If you like to eat, drink, and be merry, you're in the right place. Faith here with a welcome toast. It was Mark Twain who said, Adam was but human. This explains it all. He did not want the apple for the apple's sake. He wanted it only because it was forbidden. Please feel free to consume this show podcast in one bite, two bites, or oops, I ate the whole thing. This show is an encore presentation of the Faith Middleton Fuchmoos. Hope you enjoy this second helping. I got that sunshine in my pocket. Got that good soul in my feet. I feel that hot blood in my body when it drops. It's great to have you joining the party on the Faith Middleton Food Schmooze, inviting you to eat, drink, and be merry. Ahead, we have all kinds of great things. I'm pretty excited about this show. Charlotte Druckmann, the author of Stir, Sizzle, Bake. These are recipes for the cast iron skillet, including a cornbread with crushed Fritos in it that (laughs) makes it very crunchy and fabulous. But there are a lot of really good things in this cookbook to tell you about. We have the easiest yummy ratatouille, a way to make slow cooker apple butter for the holidays, and maybe we'll get to shrimp and plum kebabs. But more to the point, my favorite people are here, as you know, Chris Prosperi of Metro Beast Restaurant in Simsbury, Connecticut, wine broker Alex Province in Hartford, and Robin Doyen Aiken, who's also our senior contributor. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hey. All right, let's start with this. The New York Times, they get the gold medal this time because they just did an article of how to pick the fastest line at the supermarket. I think this is a genius topic. I can't wait to read this. <laughs> wait and do I'm, I'm one well, of those people. Let's talk about this because I'm going to quote from this article as we go along. Oops, because I can these, see how I do. I'm good, we're, we're all going to talk about how we do and how we can do better because that's the thing. I sometimes get line sadness. You know, I'm oh, saying, yeah. I spend quite a few minutes in my little mind trying to decide which is the best line. I skirt back and forth. Yeah, I was going like to say, a, do you jump? Monk. Yeah, but do you jump from line to line sometimes? And you're like, I've had it. I'm going to go try line oh, two. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I messed up. <laughs> and, then, and then you realize oh, that line's faster. Yep. Oh, and then stay. I stare at the <laughs> ceiling. Yep. And, uh, uh, you know, here's how I was paid back once. I was doing my, you know, a little bit of impatient thing. I'm trying not to do that anymore, but I, I did it on this particular day. And I thought it was the fast line. And there was this lady who was taking for. Ever And I was just like rolling my eyes. And she and the cashier are having a conversation that was absolutely endless. Finally, it was my turn. And I said to the cashier, you know, some remark about it, but nice, you know, not to. And she said, that woman, she said, you know, she was explaining to me, she's had cancer and she went through this whole thing and she's very lonely and I'm going to go to her house and I'm going to visit her. And I said, is she from your neighborhood? She said, no, I don't know her. I just met her right here in line. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there you go. That stops you in your tracks. That would that would yep change my paradigm. <laughs> I think Tony Robbins would say. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you so too. Here are the <laughs> here are the tips. Um, th- it starts with this. You're thinking, who's ahead of me? And you're eyeballing Scoping the, them out. the oh, things. Oh yeah, I right? look in their carts. How many? I'm, are you counting? Yeah. Do you? Totally, okay. totally. That's thirteen. Yeah, so that, that's twenty-two. So here's tip number one that's from six. from the New York Times. <laughs> right. Get behind a shopper who has a full cart, really? not not a half cart, a full cart. Now, and they say that's counterintuitive, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. As the article says. But if you look at the statistics with these math professors who do this for fun, it takes this fixed amount of time to say hello, pay, say goodbye, and clear out of the lane. In fact, that's 41 seconds when they start <laughs> timing this. And the items take about three seconds each to ring up. So you want to get in line with lots of people who have fewer things, right? Okay, yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, oh, because that 41 seconds adds up. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it yeah. goes like this. The article says one person with 100 items to be rung up will take an average of six minutes. If you get in line with four people who have 20 items, it will take an average of seven minutes. So, so it's you, longer. You've lost a minute. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, anyway. It's that really? serious when I'm at the supermarket. <laughs> really? Don't laugh. No. I, I Wait a minute. I count the seconds that they say hello to the person. <laughs> I was like, you could have done that so much faster. Huh. <laughs> you know, this all seems silly, but there was actually someone at MIT, this Professor Richard Larson, He is considered the world authority on lines, on cues. Mm. And he said that Americans spend 37 billion, with a B, hours in line every single year. See, that's got to stop. 
<laughs> well, we're trying to help you. Okay, so tip Sorry, one I is lines. you're going to find the hugest <laughs> cart. You're going to be like, this doesn't work. <laughs> get, be- get behind a shopper who has a full cart. Okay, so that's one thing. Tip number two, go left for faster service. Mm. They say here in the article that the people who study this stuff, most people are right-handed, and so when you go into a movie theater, when you go in supermarkets, whatever you do, everybody veers right. Veer left. Because that's You're just faster. generally going to huh. do better. Wow. Okay, Good. so I that's like that. what we do. I like that. Okay. The article says, look for female cashiers. Of course, my eyebrow shot up. <laughs> but he said, I know it sounds sexist, but um, female cashiers seem to be, when they did studies, the most proficient at yeah, processing I things. I agree 100%. More efficient than the guys. <laughs> I disagree. I study this. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so here, here's another tip. Study the customers ahead of you and what they're buying. This is how we examine cards. Now, I totally. do it just out of kind of a pathological Sociology. curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> Um, What's in your cart? Okay. What the people are buying can make a difference. You know, how many different items do they have? In other words, six (laughs) bottles. No, I totally do this. Six (laughs) bottles of the same soda. Goes faster. Yeah, I do this. If I see someone that has like four or five of the same things and it looks like they have a full cart, but really, they can go through really fast if they're like only seven items, but they have a lot of each one. That's the one to be behind. Okay. You see, you're smart about that. The Chevy Chase character in Saturday Night Live, the frequent flyer. Oh, you know, you could get that cheaper if you bought (laughs) bought four pack. (laughs) That's the one you want to be behind. <laughs> okay. We're going to take the supermarket chain, uh, for lack of another example, in my brain, Whole Foods, mm-hmm. where you stand in a line, and then they keep telling you which cashier mm-hmm. to go to. Oh, yeah. Uh, TJ Maxx TJ does Maxx, they have a little ring bell ringer. forward-thinking yeah. stores do this. So if you do a serpentine line, you know, the person— You're supposed to cut underneath— <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. You get this psychological relief from getting in a single line. And then if they tell you where to go, that all moves faster. So actually, people like Whole Foods and other stores have really figured that out. Okay. Um, so the article also says, look out for lines that have obstructions. And I thought, what? What, like what potholes? Or yeah, like I mean, it's like a flagman a, waving a you through. And orange- <laughs> <laughs> a bucket water dripping off the floor okay. or out of the ceiling. <laughs> Here's what they're talking about. If you're in a line at the supermarket that snakes around the corner, or if your cashier has an obstructed view of you, in other words, there's a wall or a shelf and they can't see you, that is a bad idea. Oh, then they don't know how many people are in line and they're taking their time. You can't give them the evil eye like I do sometimes. Can you move faster? You don't really do that. <laughs> yeah, I okay. totally do that. Um, you know, actually, I've been trying to use mindfulness. Like, what in the mm-hmm. world am I in thinking about? Sport? Yeah, I mean, what, like, what difference does a minute make? You know, it's like in the car. So Are you kidding me? See, I talk to everybody. I do, in too. In front of me, I behind know. me. I'm so, talking to the cashier. So, Don't get behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't even talked about the people who pull out the 50 coupons yet. Yeah. Oh, oh, my oh. gosh. Never get behind coupon people. Never, because then they're not even ready with the coupons. Okay, they're like, I'm "Oh wait, help. I have that coupon somewhere." People who pay with cash, you know, like pennies. And <laughs> oh my god! Sack change. Yeah, just whip out your card, people, and <laughs> roll know. it through in your tongue. But I'm going to help you. I'm going to help a you. Check. <laughs> Here's how I'm going to help you. I've noticed that most of the coupon. I mean, if yep. I had a coupon, I would use uh-huh. it because why wouldn't you? Yes, yeah, agreed. But. There are a lot of, I would say the majority of coupon people are seniors and or um, older, and they are uh, on budgets, they're watching their dollars, and they're pulling out their coupons. And when it began to dawn on me, um, not to seem like the angel on the show, but it began to dawn on me, and I thought, you know what? Let that person do what they need to oh, do. Just don't get behind them. <laughs> Go behind someone else. That's what I do. Yeah. I don't care that they use coupons. Just don't yeah. get behind that person. <laughs> Um, okay, now is the question here is: Is there anything all of us can do to speed up the service in the supermarket? Do you th- can you hmm. think of anything other oh. than clubbing oh, I, someone? Wait, I organize it? all my stuff together, all my vegetables, That's really cool. and, yeah, and yeah. so it goes in the bag and easier to unload. Uh-huh. Stop and shop here has that new thing where you you the can gun. actually take the gun with you and scan as you go. 
that's oh, yeah. heaven. I use and the then you just every time. roll you right do? out the door. Yep. Robin, how do you use it? I get my bags all set. Even before I start, I put my card in the thing and a zapper lights up and I pick it up and I just start zapping everything. I like it because I can keep track of how much I'm spending. Because you, it's oh yeah, every it runs time a you, total. Yeah, every time you zap, the amount comes up, and I think. And how does oh that boy. help you? How does it work when you get to the register? I never even get in line behind anyone because no one is in the special zapper kiosk <laughs> yep. area. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like a conveyor belt. What do you where do you put when you food? get to your special zapper area? You press a button on your zapper that says, "I'm done. I'm ready to check out." You scan the little barcode that comes up, and you're done. What you about pay with coupons? your I use coupons, too. I get my coupons in. You zap those, too. As you go. Yeah. Oh, as you go. No, no, I don't nope. do it nope. as I go. I do it at the end. Mm-hmm. They have a little um, scanner, and I just scan the coupon one by one. And then it, it has this little sensor where if you scan a coupon, you have to drop your coupon in the little slot. And if you don't, the automated voice will keep telling you, you know, to insert your coupon. So it's in all it's all in the up and up. Having, coupon, no please. I did. Okay. I did. I swear. I love that. That's I'm in great. and out. My, Why my am whole... I not using that? I should use I that. Know. I'm going to do that from now on if, if my supermarket has it. So here's what they're saying in the Times article about how to, you know, work with long lines at the supermarket. And we have this on our site, foodschmooze.org. Waiting in line, of course, is in our heads. People, I guess all of us, when they study us, overestimate how long we've been waiting. And that's why whether you're waiting for an elevator, wherever you're waiting, it just all seems too long. So most people are really concerned about this when they're standing in line. So Princeton University did a a study, and they said that given a choice between a slow-moving short line and a fast-moving long one, people will often go to the short line. And that's me. I see a short line, yeah. and that's what I'm going for because I just assume. I'm not watching the line. I'm assuming that, that it's going to move quickest. faster. And then I stand there, and I think, oh, this was a bad choice. <laughs> 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 so they say, as a final thing, try to lose the idea that you're cursed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> people who sit there and say to themselves, you know, that inner voice, I just have bad luck with <laughs> these lines. That's me. Do you I ever race? Yeah, I like, was gonna say I like feel bad compare. if two people are looking at the same spot. I yeah. always feel like, you know, am I being rude by you, you cutting can, them? In, you know, going they faster? do say in the article you can do that. You can, if you are two people shop, shopping, yep. you can get two carts, oh. divide up your stuff, and it will move really fast. fast because that's a good way. and. <laughs> Let your I friend know that in line. Oh, I'm, he's with me. Yeah. I, I do, absolutely. <laughs> I do. But you know what the funny part is? I let people in front of me when I have a big cart and someone's behind me with two or three items. Yeah. I always let them go before me. I do that. I do too. Yeah, right? that's good yeah. shopper etiquette. That's and, yeah. and good shopping karma. Yeah. I'm and hopefully yeah. sometimes when you go through and you have the one item and the person with the big cart goes, looks at you and smirks and then starts doing their thing. Yeah. Okay. That makes me so mad. they know you. So here's, here's my major question. Do we seem like a bunch of neurotic oh, we're fools? <laughs> we never I'm even like... talked about. I don't put food on the wet spot on the conveyor belt. I know, <laughs> I know I'm a little I'm like position out by my that. food around where the conveyor belt looks cleanest. <laughs> no, that's not etiquette. That just no, seems smart. Yeah. <laughs> How about getting the cart with the bad wheel? <laughs> I always get the stuck wheel. Not how that happens. <laughs> always get the bad cart. I cards. get it so often. Or Knock the, stuff or the, over. If the card has some things crushed up in the bottom of it, I think, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not touching that. I like that. the spinning wheel. You know, it's, it's <laughs> lopsided just, and one wheel just spins. doesn't even touch. <laughs> okay. And even if I search for the right card, I always end up with a bad card. I do try to get yeah, the so right card. I pull them. I, I do you take, wipe the handle? No, I take them for a little no, test drive no. back Use and that, forward. You know, Purelli stuff yeah. at the start. Do you at, do that? Yeah, well, I the wipes. They say, they say those handles are <laughs> horrifically dirty. I mean, they're just But gross. so is everything else. You know, I mean, <laughs> so, uh, okay. We have the easiest yummy ratatouille coming up. Tips on and a recipe at our website on how to make slow cooker apple butter. And we have this recipe for shrimp with plums, sliced plums that Ooh. really, really terrific. You can do it on the grill or do it on your stovetop or even in the oven. So all that coming your way. More mouthwatering conversation and fun ahead on the Faith Middleton Food Schmooze. I hope you will make a charitable contribution to Feed the Hungry. We are online now at foodschmooze.org and we'll be right back. Uh, uh, uh. 
Cornbread said, now that's all right. Beans. Meet me on the corner tomorrow night. Beans. I'll be ready. I'll be ready Cornbread tomorrow night. Beans. I'll be ready. I'll be ready tomorrow night. Beans. I'll be ready. I'll be ready tomorrow night. Beans. That's what Bean said to Cornbread. Ah, uh, we ready. have a free podcast for you, meaning you'll never miss a drop of pleasure on this show. You just sign up for it once at our site, and then we automatically send you our show every week so you can listen on your schedule. I'm with my treasured food buddies, Chris Prosperi, chef and co-owner of Metro Beast Restaurant in Simsbury, Connecticut, wine broker Alex Province of Hartford. And we are ready with some things. We've got that uh, shrimp and plum recipe for the grill. Mm. We have how to make slow cooker apple butter and that's going to be good for the holidays so you might want to start working on that now with all the apples Mm. coming in but first we're going to start with something i have been making every single (laughs) day practically as i want this constantly it's um what we call easiest yummy ratatouille this is a, a recipe we kind of developed looking at six different recipes at my house and it also is inspired by Chris Prosperi because of something that he said. So we're telling you about how to make this ratatouille the easiest, easiest way. And with a minimum of fat, so it's it's lighter, because the markets are still flooded with eggplant and zucchini. And you just get a little Parmesan cheese and you are good to go. So, Chris, you once said to me that while uh, you were grilling, you just threw on a bunch of vegetables, and then when they came off the grill, you took a big knife and you went chop, 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 threw them in a bowl with a little oil and vinegar, and there you go. That's dinner. So Mm. that's what I kept in mind when we were merging these six recipes to try and get what we thought was the easiest and most yummy ratatouille, and it worked. I have to say that. So here's what you want to do. You chop up the eggplant, the zucchini, throw in some fresh rosemary if you want right Chris Mm -hmm, Um, some garlic uh, minced up and you put some olive oil on a sheet pan and then throw all the veggies in one inch cubes cut them all up into one inch cubes onto the earth, throw in the garlic, and then I put a little cayenne pepper in there too. I threw in some rosemary, chopped up some, a little bit of basil. Anyway, I just mixed it all up with my fingers. So everything was lightly coated with the olive oil and then just roasted it for about, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes Mm, in a 450 degree oven. They got nice and charred. Every 15 minutes I took a a, a spatula and sort of moved Mm. the vegetables around a little bit. And then about Three quarters of the way through the cooking, I threw in cherry tomatoes, mm. Ooh, capers, yeah. mm. nice. and um, chopped Kalamata olives. You Ooh, don't have beautiful. to do that, but yeah. oh my goodness, it Salty, was the most yeah. wonderful. I, of course, yeah. I salted all this. Yeah. And so then when it's done, I just threw it all into a big bowl, drizzled it with a little more fresh olive oil for richness. A couple glugs. I used sherry wine vinegar. You could use red wine vinegar. Some people might want balsamic. balsamic yeah. Just a little bit of it and then toss 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 taste it make sure all the seasonings are right add something if I, if I need to and then I wait for it to get to room temperature because mm. you really taste it more than if it's steaming hot yep. that's just the way it is it's like pizza in a certain sense anyway delicious I have to say be a great sandwich that's what I'm Mm. saying I take that mixture and put it on focaccia as a sandwich I put Mm. salmon grilled salmon on top of it Mm. I do chicken on top of that I'll have it in my refrigerator I'll just take some pita bread or some store-bought pizza dough and make pizza with it that's why when you make Mm. something like that make a ton you'll Mm. never run out of things to do with it how how long will it last oh oh, up to a week in your refrigerator after it's cooked okay so every day you're gonna find a use for Sprinkle it on top of just some greens and Mm. have a salad. Or pasta. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Wow. Anything. There's so many uses. Really, just try this. It is mm. so delicious. Foodschmooze.org. That's where the recipe is posted under Easiest Yummy Ratatouille. Now, here we're going to go to, because apples are starting to come in, mm. slow cooker apple butter. Now, why it's called apple butter, I don't know. I think it's like <laughs> sort of bad marketing from the I don't know, the pilgrims or something, because there's no butter in apple butter. It's just really applesauce 
but it's so easy to make in a slow cooker, Chris. Yeah. And the first time I had it was actually at a restaurant, and they served it with bread, which is why it was down south. And that's yeah. why I think it yeah. got that kind of butter name on well, it. People because you put it on toast yeah. in the morning. Right. But here's the thing that is well, the reason we're doing this recipe now is we're saving it. If people want to do things ahead for Thanksgiving or for the holiday meal of any kind, this applesauce on top of brie. Ooh. With some toasted Ooh. walnuts Ooh. sprinkled on top is such a fabulous appetizer Starter, for yeah. any any Normalize holiday onions. kind of yeah. thing. Yes. Okay. So how easy is this? By the way, the recipe is also you want on me our with site. The slow cooker. <laughs> slow cooker. I mean, really. We're all looking at you. Which size? Which size would I use when I make this? All right. One? How easy is this? Sugar, cinnamon, cloves, and salt, and you just mix it together in a large mm-hmm. bowl. It'll sit in the bottom, and then you just pour diced apples into that bowl. Mix in a little honey, too, with with the sugar, cinnamon, and then mix it, mix it, mix it, and it's all coated. And then you just put that in your slow cooker, and you cook it for about 45 minutes. You taste it. Make sure it's all okay. Do you need a little more honey or whatever? Then you put it back on again on low with the lid back on overnight. Mm -hmm. So 9 to 11 hours. It just sits there overnight. When you get up in the morning, your house smells so incredible. You can put this on pancakes. Or oatmeal. You could use it to make a loaf bread in the morning if you have guests coming over for brunch. You could just eat it with a spoon because it is so good. You could put it in the freezer until the holidays arrive. Okay, it is absolutely terrific, terrific, terrific. At the very end, you're going to do it for a little bit longer with the lid off because that thickens it up, right, Chris? Yeah, yeah, but it, it, this is simple. Three easy steps and you have apple butter. Great idea. And it does. It freezes amazingly well. Put it in those little takeout pint containers. Yep. Stack it in your freezer and then all throughout the holidays, you just pull them one at a time for you each event. you can like your ugly apples too yeah. right mm-hmm. and you have you yeah. know all the oh, yeah imperfect Especially ones. if you like take the kids and go but apple picking he, right here's this the key we're telling recipe. you in the recipe because this is what we figured out if you use a variety of apples this is going to be the best ever Different flavors yeah. a- apple butter mm-hmm. or applesauce because it makes it more complex if you use just one kind of apple so you go to your farmer's market farm stand even the supermarket you know we like to buy local because we're an apple growing region mm-hmm. And why not? This is the time to do it. So you buy several varieties, four if you want, and then just dice them up, put them in there. The recipe's at foodschmoes.org. It's really good. Did you peel them or not? Yeah. You did? Okay. Sure. Okay. Here we go. I was trying to think about fall fruits. So I went online. I was looking at every kind of recipe imaginable. And I came upon this, and I thought it was so good. This is just to give you an idea of what to do with a fall fruit plums. Love plums. You, this is one where we don't even need the recipe for this, right? You can just go at it and Wing have it. a good time. Yeah. Shrimp and plum kebabs for the grill. Mm. I think that is so interesting. If you don't want to do kebabs, because they can be a pain. If you just want to throw this in a cast iron skillet and do it on top of the stove, you could do it. But anyway, this is an interesting combination of things. The recipe, as I found it, says you want to mix together some canola oil and chopped cilantro if you like it and lime zest and lime juice and salt. Whisk that all together. Set some aside so you can have it as a dressing for the salad. Then you just throw the shrimp into that little bit of dressing with some diced up jalapenos Mm -hmm. and some sliced plums that have been pitted and cut into little wedges. Mm. Toss it to coat it and let just let it sit there for a little while. If you've got a grill, you got you set your grill so it's ready to go, and you make these kebabs, or you don't even have to make kebabs. Just put everything on the grill, the shrimp, the pieces of plum, and or just basket. grill them. Yeah, I'm just thinking in my head, just if I were to do this, I think I would do it in a, little, in a pan like you said. I would just toss the shrimp and the plums, maybe a little rosemary, for some reason I'm thinking, and some good olive oil, and just bake and lime. it. Yeah, and lime, and just, or lemon, and just bake it all together. You do it. In a you pan. bake the pan? Yeah, either, or, or put it on the grill and shut the lid, right? So it sort of roasts uh-huh. in there. Yeah, oh my God, the plum. And, and I've never, it's very rare that I, a flavor combination comes at me. Plum where I jalapeno? Have, plum jalapeno and shrimp. Just it, Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, I want to taste it. I really want to taste it. 
I know. I thought it was fantastic. And I want to give credit. Eating well. Oh, this is magazine. this was on their site. I guess it's a test kitchen recipe yeah. for them. I thought it was really terrific. Yeah, plums and shrimp. Someone shrimp proposed putting kebabs. it on like brown rice afterwards, which would be healthy if you sure. want to like, yeah, fill you up a little bit more. You know, or if you're not doing carbs, you, you don't yeah. have to. This sounded really right? fun. Yeah, I, it catches I'm, your it catches you, doesn't it? The plum yeah. shrimp thing. Yeah. I have and three plum, plums in my kitchen that I need to. There's something, something with, about some cooking stone fruits that makes them, especially yeah. plums that oh. can be a little too tart. Yep, yep. Agreed. You start cooking them caramelizes. in this way, and it caramelizes, even though you've got this limey thing mm. going on. It all somehow plays together, and it works because you've got that protein mixed in with it. So you're in your fork, a little bite of shrimp, mm. a little bit of the lime oh stuff, God. and, the, and the, I'll the, put the, it on a salad. Yeah, so the delicious. plum has that depth of flavor too that I just love, and texture that I love. How hot are the jalapenos, though? I never really eat them like that. Well, well if you take the off, seeds. Yeah, yeah, you take out the source. seeds and the membrane, and then it's just the flavor with a little bit of heat. I love using So it's jalapenos. like a green pepper almost? Yeah, but it's got some heat. I like that. But yeah, de-seed it and, and take out the little the stem and the inside, that the little white, white part, part, and you're fine. So yeah. Alex, one of the things I do, because I don't like super hot, yeah. I chop up a little bit, dice it fine, and I mix it in with my thing, and then I just stick my finger in, swirl it around, and taste. And if it's crazy hot, I think, oh, oh I've uh -oh. gone too far. I'm going to need yogurt or sour cream at the end of this thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sometimes I find myself even adding a little bit more because I start small and then yeah. just increase as I go. We were talking about this in our kitchen the other day. Jalapenos, like when you eat them by themselves, yeah. they're dangerous. Just taking a bite out of a little jalapeno is dangerous. But you put it on a sandwich, like she said. You mince it up small and you put it on things or in things. Then you really get, you get a little bit of heat, but the flavor comes out more than rather when you bite it and all you get is the heat. Yeah. So Chris is making from scratch tomato sauce, which honestly is the best I've ever had in my entire life. Oh. But do you want Can the recipe? Can you describe how to do it? It's not even, and there is no recipe for this tomato sauce. This is this right comes, out of your head. The, no, it comes from an Italian woman that worked with a friend of mine in North Carolina, believe it or not. How do you do and it? And she takes tomatoes, and whatever tomatoes you have, cut them in half and throw them in a pot, right? Yep. In a heavy bottom pot. Turn on the stove, cook it over medium oh. heat until they get soft and they start breaking they apart. They don't burn down there. Nope. nope. You, know, you keep mixing it. That's why heavy bottom pot and they're whole. No it's, olive oil? They're nothing. Just have tomatoes in a pot right? Okay. Very easy. Then when they get cooked and soft, and they don't have to all be broken down yet, they just enough to where you can take an immersion blender and stick it in the pot and puree it. Now, if you don't have them in an immersion blender, you can just use the back of a spoon or something yeah, and Yeah, then mush you cook it, it more and you mush it up. Gotcha. But okay. I mean, immersion blender is the best thing in the I world. I know. You should have one just to make margaritas no, in the summer, I know. please. But no, I have one. I love the thing. Yeah. Okay, go okay. ahead. Then I strain it because I like getting out the seeds and the skins. I have a really big colander kind of thing that has little holes, yeah. and I sort of push it through it. Then I take that, that liquid, put it back in the pot, and it's very runny. It's very liquidy, right? Then I add a ton of onion powder. And I mean like a ton of onion powder. Like a quarter cup or a third if, of a if, cup? If or... I had a six quark pot, yeah. which would be a small spaghetti batch. Pot. Yeah, spaghetti pot. If I had a spaghetti pot, I would put probably one of those whole little round shakers in. Wow. It gets a wow. lot of onion so powder. That's, that's about Again, a... not my recipe. That's a third of a cup, I would yeah, think. Yeah, that's about a third of a cup. So it gets a ton of not onion granulated, not onion salt, but plain powder. onion powder. This is a riot. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, and then I take a uh, small handful of chopped garlic, throw that in, salt, and then a, a few glugs of olive oil. Wow. Just, and it All has right. to be enough olive oil Wait, to where it's sitting go, like a half Let's go inch over this. Out. Let's go over this, right. people, because it is the best tomato sauce of my life. I'm not kidding you. Okay. So you said cut the tomatoes in half, yep. a pot with nothing in it, yep. just on medium, yep. on the stove. Throw your tomatoes in, cut yep. in half, and look until they start to break down, not yep. even all of them. Yep. Then you put the immersion blender in there mm -hmm. and you puree, it. puree them. Then you take them out and put them in a colander with or holes strainer. Yep. or a strainer, strainer with a little and holes. you mash it through so to that get, you're, you yep. get the good liquid and the seeds and the skin are out. Yep. Third of a cup or a small jar of onion powder and then glugs of olive oil yep. and chopped then garlic. Chopped garlic, yep. a and handful. It goes you right cook. back on the stove and yep. you cook and, it until you I mean. get the thickness that you like my friend liked it a little thinner that's than it. i do i like it a little thicker that's it. and at the at, right when you take it off the stove handfuls of whole basil 
I don't even chop it. Just handfuls oh, of whole basil the wash. The best, and You the mix best that in, and then you put it in oh. containers and freeze it. Oh, for the wait a minute. We thank you so much for that recipe, Chris. The author of Stir Sizzle Bake is coming up next, and there's even a Frito. Yes, as in Frito. <laughs> a Frito cornbread, as I promised. <laughs> we love the local. Please support your local food growers and food makers. And for On Demand Podcast Delivery of the Food Schmooze Party every week, and to find, I think, terrific food, wine, cocktail, restaurant, hot topics, our short, fun streaming videos, and recipes that we feature, we're always online talking with you at foodschmooze.org. We'll be right back. The cast down so nothing turns you on. Nothing turns you on like my cast iron pan. This is the Food Schmooze Party, offering the richness of life and coming to you in Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York, including Westchester County, the east end of Long Island, and of course, the Hamptons. The senior producer is Robin Doyen Aiken. To hear the show on WNPR, it airs Thursdays at 3, Saturdays at noon. Podcast and our curated recommendations are always online at foodschmooze.org. Of course, we're on Facebook, too. Search Faith Middleton. Okay, everybody knows how wonderful a cast iron skillet is for making cornbread and biscuits and cobblers, other classics. We love those recipes. But now, modernist skillet cook Charlotte Druckmann has kicked it up a notch in her book, Stir, Sizzle, Bake. Druckmann offers cast iron skillet recipes that are interesting, international with flavors, complex in some cases, and... And using ingredients, frankly, you might not associate with cast iron. Whether you want to go complex or keep it simple, we're interested in talking with Charlotte about how versatile the cast iron skillet can be. So join us in finding out how and why she uses this humble pan to think outside the box, even fancy. Charlotte Druckmann is a food writer. She's been in lots of publications that you would know. She is co-founder of Food 52s. Oh, my goodness. We love those cookbooks. They're Piglet Tournament of Cookbooks. And she's also author of some cookbooks, Skirt Steak. She's co-author of Cooking Without Borders with Anita Lowe, who is a fabulous chef. And Charlotte lives just down the road in New York. So welcome to the Food Schmooze. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. We're big fans of cast iron skillet cooking here on the show. We like the price point. We like what it does. (laughs) And we see that you have really kicked this up a notch. So this is interesting. There have been a couple of skillet cookbooks in the past, I don't know, decade or something. But why did you turn to this? I had helped Anita Lowe write her cookbook, and then I had written a book about women chefs, but I had never actually written my own cookbook before, and honestly, it was not something I had thought of doing ever. I had done a story in the Wall Street Journal about using your skillet to bake breads on your stovetop, because I thought that's a lot less daunting-seeming than starting to work with yeast and waiting for your dough to rise Mm -hmm. and putting in the oven, and really what those things had in common was a cast iron skillet. But at the time, that wasn't so much what I was thinking about. I was just thinking about that ease and the gateway to making bread. And a publisher at Clarkson Potter asked me if I would like to turn it into a cookbook. And I honestly, simultaneously thought, you're crazy. (laughs) And thought, oh, I actually know how I would do that cookbook. First of all, I love your candor. Second of all, (laughs) Uh, what came into your mind when you said, I know what I would do with that? What, yeah. what was it? I saw the way that this book is structured. I saw it immediately. And, and what I thought was the cast iron skillet is such a wonderful way to teach people how to bake because it gives you this control variable that makes it a, a little bit less scary. I actually think a lot less scary. People think of all the non-baking things you can do in it, right? They're always thinking about, you know, mm-hmm. I can make dinner in this pan, but they don't realize how much you can bake in it. 
the things you can bake in it really are such accessible, doable things. And I knew that, and I thought I could use that cookbook to teach myself and other people how to bake. I I really like this philosophy in terms of coming up with something that's not intimidating for people, but also throwing in, I I have to say, international ingredients sometimes, or oils, something that people might not be familiar with, which is fantastic because it gets us to look outside the box. So as you're listening to this show, as with all our cookbook authors. We are assuming you haven't seen this cookbook yet. Just think of it as ideas trying to inspire you to try things. So let me start with this. Later on, I'm going to get to how to clean a cast iron skillet. (laughs) Right now, I want to talk about one of the breads that you do in your pan, and it is a favorite of mine. It's roti, an Indian flatbread. People who go to Indian restaurants will know this. It's a little bit thick, and it has a kind of oily or buttery feel, and it's so delicious. (laughs) Um, So this is extra coconutty roti. So we have grated unsweetened coconut, unbleached all-purpose flour, spelt flour, a little salt, freshly ground green cardamom pods, or you can buy just ground cardamom, warm water, some coconut oil, and some coconut butter for serving. You're going to put maple syrup on here. Tell me how easy is, is this to do for a breakfast bread? It is so easy. It's like making a pancake batter, a very thick pancake batter that has coconut in it. That's really what it's like. Just in terms of the process, all you're doing is making them on your really, really hot pan. They just are the most coconut flavored things you can imagine without being sweet, which is, again, for breakfast, sometimes you really don't want all of Mm -hmm. that sugar. And then we fix that by putting maple syrup. (laughs) (laughs) Just and butter. Regular butter. So would you ever, any of you, hearing me describe that, would you try something like this instead of pancakes yeah, just as totally. something new? Yeah. yeah, no question. Oh, yeah. You think it's kid-friendly, too? I think so. Maybe I might throw some chocolate chips in there or something. And then <laughs> oh. can, that, that's the, what makes it kid-friendly. Like Mars bar. Maybe bananas yeah. in, in yeah. there. I could see working. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's a good idea. I am talking with Charlotte Druckmann, and she is author of Stir, Sizzle, Bake. And these are pretty sophisticated recipes for your cast iron skillet, although you can hear some of these are easy. I want to turn now to this one because I am a crazy, crazy Arepa <laughs> fan. Oh, yeah. So this you is... You do look for them, too, don't you? I look for them everywhere. <laughs> I even <laughs> found some... I found, Mary, uh, on the east end of Long Island, yeah. there's Mary's Marvelous yeah. in East Hampton and in Amagansett. She makes the most <laughs> astonishing arepas. Yeah. So these are lazy cheese arepas with slaw, and we have this recipe on our site. Of course we do. Uh, Charlotte, let me do the ingredients. Uh, Butter, frozen or fresh corn, corn flour, that's called harina. You might have to look in a supermarket that has a um, Mexican population, Spanish population. Yes, Latin. And then some sugar and water and a soft, fresh cheese, Tell me how these go together, because I've never made my own. I tried to find the flour, and I had a little bit of trouble. Where do you get your flour? You can actually get it online, Amazon.com. You can get the flour there. In our our broadcast area, there are a number of Spanish Spanish neighborhoods neighborhoods and markets. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yes, usually when you see these kinds of really cheesy arepas that get this almost like a grilled look to them. Mm -hmm. They're done under a broiler or they're done on a grill. I thought, how can you do this on your stove without having to put them in the oven? Just because it saves you that step. So I incorporate charred corn in there, which is what you're doing with that corn. And you use the pan that you're going to make the arepas in, the cast iron skillet also to char the corn. So it's very quick. It's easy. It's You do the corn, and then you just keep on going with the recipe. And then, yeah, you put a lot of cheese into that dough, and you put them on that really hot skillet. Yeah, what kind of cheese? You want a soft cheese, like a queso blanco would be perfect, or even a queso fresco, or you can combine them. I'm I'm a big advocate of combining your cheese. You get a more complex, rich, cheesy flavor. And then I also use a little bit of a cow's milk cheese that's going to be a little bit harder, like a cotija, but you could also use a pecorino romano. Manchego. 
Yes, yes. You're going to put those on the pan at a really high heat, so they're going to get that beautiful, melty kind of brown cheese thing happening. These are so delicious. A couple times I went to the East End and I had, you know, right this, and Mary's Marvelous, but when I got them at the supermarket, I just had them for lunch, I don't know, for a week. (laughs) So it was just fantastic. Overload. This this recipe, by the way, to make the dough, you just throw this stuff in a bowl until it becomes the consistency consistency of play-doh that's a great description and then you just you know make it into these patties and you put it in the cast iron skillet and then you just fry them and there you go okay <laughs> yeah. yeah i have a question about cast iron skillet okay go ahead size do you have a size that you suggest for someone just starting out because i know they come as big as what 16 inch i've seen right really big ones and as small as like six inch and there's some novelty ones that are teeny. I think they're Christmas ornaments. I'm not really sure why they were, why they were made. I pulled a tree over. I very deliberately did all of the recipes in this book in a 10 inch. I just I okay. didn't want anyone to have to go and buy another pan. If you're someone who bakes a lot, the 10 inch is perfect. Mm. If you're going to be using it to feed things that are more kind of savory, non-bread or baked dishes, and you've got a family of four, Then I would go for a 12-inch. So me personally, I've become a cast iron junkie. I feel it's essential for me to have both a 10-inch and a 12-inch. Okay. And and we are going to get to a wholesome apple quince pie. That might be good to keep in mind for the holidays. Uh, Very quickly, you have a recipe in your book for cheesy Frito bread. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> yes. that's good. Anything Fritos. with Fritos. <laughs> Frito crumbs from Fritos are in this recipe, Yum. which is hilarious. It's a pretty southern thing, right? Yeah, I think it's delicious. I had had some really great pimento cheese in the south, and mm. I had become kind of fixated on it. And I was thinking, how would you put that into cornbread? And I'm not really sure why I then thought Fritos, but I guess I was thinking that I'd like to be able to dip Fritos into the <laughs> pimento cheese. And then and it all ended up in a bread. Put the Fritos into the <laughs> cornbread, because if you ground them up, they'd kind of be a little bit like cornmeal. That was how that happened. Well, you do them in these little tiny... Um, I believe they're actually called corn stick pans. Yes, yes. So what happens with the Fritos is that it makes a crust on them, but so does the pan edge when you do it the long way like that. So I just want to tell you that's in there. Um, Okay. (laughs) I want to tell you that there's another thing in here that I love, which is soca. It's something that I had in the south of France, which uses chickpea flour. And you would go in the old part of the city, and there would be a lady usually on this giant grill, flat iron grill. She would pour the dough, and then it would be this giant thing, and she'd fold it over and hand it to you. We'd sit, and you'd have a beer and this soca Mm. as your 4 o'clock snack. Unbelievably Mm. delicious. So this tells you how to make that soca. Uh, with lamb, olives, and oregano. In other words, the (laughs) lamb is kind of with all these incredible Middle Eastern spices ground up uh, like a kind of ham, sloppy Joe's kind of thing Uh. on top of the (laughs) soca crepe. Okay, so... (laughs) I'm just Can we have that too? Like crazy <laughs> over oh my this. gosh. And and you know what, Charlotte, you and I got the soca recipe from the same source, Mark Bittman. Yep. There you go. Okay, here's on our website the carrot current crostata. I've never thought of this combination before. How about you? Never. No. 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 But I okay. Like it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I get excited about any sort of savory tart or cake just because we're so used to thinking about baking as a, a mostly sweet endeavor. You're going to roast your carrots first, and you can roast them in the skillet. It's a great roasting pan. And you're going to really quickly season them with some cumin and pomegranate molasses, which a little mm. bit goes a long way, and it adds such a wonderful flavor. Oh, yeah. And then that's going to be the filling for the galette dough, which, you know, galette's kind of like a roughshod kind of pie crust. It's a lot less pressure, I think. You don't have to make it perfect. It's deliberately a bit rustic and folded over, and then you just put it right back in the oven, and it bakes, and there you go. It's lunch. So unusual mm-hmm. as like something to serve. Let's make sure we have time for um, how to clean a skillet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, your apple quince pie. For the filling, quince, uh, the juice of an orange, white wine, apples, vanilla bean, and some sea salt, 
peppercorns, orange zest, and sugar. That's quite a filling. And then for the crust, you use a spelt flour, uh, regular flour, and some butter and water and egg, sugar, and sea salt. So tell me about how you came up with this recipe. I had had a pie that this woman named Heather Lanier in Big Sur makes. and um, This is on her website, by the way. Go it, ahead. She's known for making pie, and she really tries to use as little sugar as possible, and she does mm-hmm. like to use whole grains and flours in her dough. And I love that because I think so much in this book is so intensely flavored and it's got a lot of butter and a lot of you know this is a really clean pie and i i love that you can really taste the fruit the thing about this pie that i think is so user friendly is that a lot of the time when you're making pie you chill your dough in between and this one you work really quickly it's a double crust and you just do it all in one go and Hmm. put it in the oven how do you describe the combination of apples and quince quince has this tartness to it, almost like a sourness. But I think because of that, it's got a little bit more complexity than an apple, which is sort of more straightforward, if, if you will, and, and kind of earthy. And so that quince just picks it up. You know, it's, it's a little bit like adding lemon juice to apples or any sort of acid. It mm-hmm. kind of does that. Mm-hmm. And, and you already have some of that in the pie. So it just wakes it up a little bit more. So it, does it tend to be a tart pie? Yes, it's more... Heart, although the apples really balance that out. I want to try it. And it's just really beautiful. It's subtle. I think it's not a hit you over the head thing. Um, and because it's poached in wine again, too, you just get that little bit of that winey flavor without it being alcoholic. And I think that really plays to the quince. Ah, this cookbook is called Stir, Sizzle, Bake. These are recipes for your cast iron skillet, sometimes using international ingredients or unusual flours, etc. Charlotte Druckmann is our guest and author of the book. How to Clean a Cast Iron Skillet. I remember once reading an article in the Times by Mark Bittman, and he said, oh, please, never mind the seasoning business. I all the time use soap in cleaning my cast iron pan, and I just re-season it by putting a little oil in it and heating it on the stove for a few minutes before I put it away. And so I have done that ever since. What about you, Charlotte? That, you- you're doing it right. People don't realize that it's very low maintenance as long as you're regular about it, right? It's when you don't do anything and you leave your pan for months and maybe you didn't put it back right or you didn't thoroughly dry it and it gets rusty and rust is the devil. Rust is the thing that makes the rest of this just a big pain and as long as you're being diligent and being diligent by the way does not require a lot of work at all Mm -hmm. you can use dish soap on it you don't want to use a really rough dish soap you don't want to use bleach and you never want to put it in the dishwasher ever chris you even like restored pans like that you found a tag sale or something i have a uh Sandblaster. Sandblaster at home in the barn. And we just, <laughs> so I, for, like a for, quick sandblaster. I'll, I'll get out my <laughs> sandblaster. I just want to say that if, you know, there are different levels of fixer uppers yeah. on the pan. Yeah. So most people you can buy one and you're not going to have to need a sandblaster. That's, those are like the really serious fixer uppers. Like, like I personally would not take that on. <laughs> but it came out like new, right? You have yeah, no idea like what, what these people are like. They're, they're just amazing scientists here on the show. <laughs> um, I, I do the, exactly the same thing that you do, Faith. I just, uh, I, my thing is I every time I'm done washing it, when I dry it, I put it on the stove over low heat for about five minutes yeah. just because that ensures that any water that might have been stuck in your skillet gets sucked out. I usually will oil it, but every time I'm done drying it and heating it, I add for a 10-inch skillet up to a teaspoon of oil. You don't want any more more than that. And I like using flaxseed oil. And then you just want to rub it evenly over the pan, the whole pan, not just the inside of the pan, the whole pan. And then you just blot it. You want to make sure you don't get areas that have too much oil. Okay, Charlotte, I just use whatever oil's around with a paper towel. (laughs) And then then I say, there you go. And so far it's working. Um, Charlotte Druckmann, Stir, Sizzle, Bake is her cookbook, and three of her recipes are on her site right now at foochmoose.org.
Energy, plus information about her book. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much for having me. We're on WNPR Thursdays at 3, Saturdays at noon. And weekdays, listen for my 60-second food schmoozes. And remember, never eat more than you can lift. In New Haven, I'm Faith Middleton. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast on your schedule. And when you need a little more party in your life, we're here online at foodschmooze.org. And we hope you'll talk with us on Facebook. We're at Faith Middleton Foodschmooze.